are live. So good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Today, it's a little bit of all three, which is super exciting. So right now, we're joined by eight classes from across North America. It's a packed house. Joe went a little crazy filling this one, but you guys are all super excited. So I'm going to give you guys a chance to say a bit of a hello before we dive in with our speaker, literally and figuratively. So we've got Mr. Gorgie's grade fours in Wadsworth in Illinois. Hi, guys. Welcome in. Let's see. Hi. Hey, welcome in. Oh, there's so many of you. <laughs> I love it. We've got Miss Carton's grade sixes in Anchorage in Alaska. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey, what you guys lack in numbers, you always make up for an enthusiasm. I love it. We've got Miss Vitato's grade six through eights in Augusta in Kansas. Hi, guys. Hey. So nice having so many Kansas classes nowadays. Every single session I have, I swear. Uh, Miss Michael's grade four is in Glenview in Illinois. Hi, guys. <laughs> We've got Miss George's grade ones in West Palm Beach in Florida. Hi, Miss George's class. Hi. Hi. <laughs> you guys are our young ones today. We're expecting some really cool questions from you. Uh, we've got Miss Rukowski's grade three fours in Flatirons Elementary in Colorado. Let me just get your mic. Hi. 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 <laughs> and last but not least, we've got Mr. Kozachinsky's grade twos in Canton in Michigan. Hi, guys. Hi. <laughs> Whoa, okay, we broke the record for enthusiasm at the end. Way to go, Mr. K's class. All right, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Ecuador by Alex Byrne, and he is the lead on the Galapagos Whale Shark Project. He also created the Shark Research Project at the Charles Darwin Research Foundation in the beautiful Galapagos Islands. He has worked and studied all over the world in pursuit of some of the coolest creatures on Earth. And alongside being a super cool scientist, he loves talking about it, whether it's from the BBC, National Geographic, and more. Alex has been featured in a huge number of fantastic programs highlighting the neat work that he does. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Alex, and uh, take it away. All right, well, hi everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many faces from all over the world. That's amazing in Anchorage as well, in Alaska. Wow, that's so cool. Um, so um, yeah, so my name is Alex and uh, I wanted to talk to you today about sharks because I'm just shark crazy, as you can see behind me, I kind of have shark things everywhere. Um, but before I start talking about sharks, I thought it might be interesting for you guys to hear, you know, how does someone end up where I am? So I'm in Quito right now. And Quito is the capital of Ecuador. So I'm, it's a tiny little country right on the equator um, on the coast of the Pacific. Um, and, and Quito is actually the capital. And it's about, oh, I want to say maybe 8,000 feet high, something like that. So it's really high up. It's about as far as you can get from the ocean in terms of altitude uh, and still be able to breathe properly. So what am I doing? in the Andes when I'm a shark researcher. <laughs> uh, so basically I studied marine biology. I was always crazy about the ocean. I grew up watching Sylvia Earle and Jacques Cousteau and listening to David Attenborough. And I, and I just wanted to go out there and, and understand yeah. how the ocean works. So I studied in England and then I went up to study in Scotland in some islands called the Orkney Islands. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Orkney Islands, but they're far away, they're windswept, uh, and they're full of ancient tombs from Neolithic era, um, the era with cavemen and stuff. Fascinating. Also taken over by Vikings at some point, which might have been a pretty scary time. Uh, so I studied up there. I did my PhD there. And then I realized after I finished that I just loved living on islands. Um, but I felt like a little bit of a change from a cold island like Orkney to something maybe a little warmer. Uh, so I went to the Galapagos. Uh, and in the Galapagos Islands, I was a fisheries biologist. So we have a marine reserve there, um, but it's a, kind of a special marine reserve because you're allowed to fish so long as you're not an industrial fisher person. So they, they, they fish for lobster, they fish for a few other things. And because I was a fisheries biologist, I went there. And then I went there as a volunteer for six months, and that was 20 years ago, and, and I'm still working there. Uh, and, and, and I guess after I've been there for a few years, some of the local fishermen, they wanted to start fishing for sharks. 
And we weren't sure whether that was such a good idea because we already knew that around the world, shark populations are starting to decline because of overfishing. So we, we did an experiment and it was an absolute nightmare. Uh, they were catching more sharks than anything else. Uh, and in the end, thankfully, uh, they cut that off and closed it down. But I became really interested in, in how sharks behave and also to what extent does this Galapagos Marine Reserve actually protect them? Do they live there all year round? Are they migrating through? Um, and I realized there was no one there studying them. And so I thought, well, if no one's doing it, I guess I'll just do it myself. Uh, and that was really where, where my work began. And that was 15 years ago. And I thought it would be a, maybe a two or three year project. <laughs> and it's turned into a long-term project. I have students from all over the world who go on and then get their own PhDs and continue to work there. So it's an amazing place to work. Um, and I kind of wanted to share with you a few slides so you can get a feel for, for, for the work we're doing. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna try and share my screen with you. And I'm not very good at this technology, so we'll see how. Okay. We can save sharks, we can travel over the world, can we figure out Zoom together? We'll find out in a few seconds. Perfect, you're great. <laughs> So my lab um, is, is the aquatic biotelemetry lab. And that means, aquatic means water, and biotelemetry means how, how can we track animals? And, and obviously the animals I work with most are sharks, right? So I have a cool shark logo. And then I work with a lot of different institutions because the important thing with this research is that you can't do it on your own. It, it's too much work. And so um, we set up a regional network of scientists called Migramar, you can see that down on the left. Um, I'm a professor now at the University of Quito. Um, we also have a center in Galapagos called the Galapagos Science Center. You can see down there with the iguana. Um, I'm part of something called the Galapagos Whale Shark Project, and I'm part of the Marine Megafauna Foundation for Ecuador. So I have a lot of hats that I wear, depending on, <laughs> depending on who I'm talking to, but I just won't wear a hat at all today. Um, so this is the region of the world we're looking at. Uh, so if you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Can you see my mouse? Yeah, we can, it's great. So if you can see, this is a big map of the world. Um, so you guys are mostly up here in, the, in Canada and the US. We're looking at this part of the world down here. So the Eastern Tropical Pacific. And in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, uh, there's a lot of oceanic islands. And the most famous of those are probably the Galapagos Marine Reserve. And they're famous because this is where Charles Darwin came over a hundred years ago, and he figured out that species evolved, that they weren't all created as they are. And he was looking at these animals thinking they're kind of similar, but they're different as well. And how does that work? So Galapagos really became famous because of that. But there's other islands too. Cocos National Park is an absolute gem. And I probably think most of you know where Cocos is. Maybe you don't know that you know, but you probably know. Just raise your hand if you've ever seen a movie called Jurassic Park. Can I see any hands there? Yeah, okay. So at the beginning of that movie, when, when uh, the, the, guy, the guy with the white beard goes to the desert, right, and he talks to those geologists, and then they get into a chopper and they're flying over the ocean and they see this beautiful green rocky island. That's Cocos. So there's no dinosaurs on Cocos. Um, but there are tons and tons of amazing sharks. And then there's some others as well, like Malpelo. So we like to call this area the golden triangle for hammerhead sharks. Um, and each of these islands belongs to different countries. So Galapagos over here belongs to Ecuador. Malpelo belongs to Colombia. Coiba belongs to Panama. And Cocos belongs to Costa Rica. And so we've started working in this region between the four countries to try and make sure that we're doing the same kind of work, that we're communicating with each other, and we're trying to understand how these oceanic islands are really protecting these migratory species. Ah, there's Cocos. Isn't it beautiful? Absolute stunner of an island. You know, they say, they say that Atahualpa's treasure, well, the treasure of Lima, was all hidden there by pirates uh, a couple of hundred years ago, and every so often people go there and they try to find it. But I think the real treasure is just looking at the island and going underwater and being surrounded by sharks and turtles. So I'm not a big fan on treasure hunting. I think the treasure is looking there right at you. Galapagos, of course, is famous because of its giant tortoises. 
Um, but it's also got some spectacular landscape. And this is Darwin's Arch. So this is the northernmost island of Galapagos in the background back here. It's a tiny island. It's like one square mile. And then there's a rocky platform underwater full of coral. And then you have this beautiful arch and you have the sun setting through it. And underneath, it just drops down into the deep. And this is probably the most amazing site in the world for sharks. It really is spectacular. And I, and I always say it's kind of fitting that it's marked by that beautiful arch. And even though Darwin never actually visited it, it's a kind of nice way to play tribute to him. So Darwin's arch, beautiful above water, unbelievable below. So this is something we see pretty much any day when we're underwater in Darwin's arch. This is a school of hammerhead sharks. Um, I wouldn't even attempt to count those. I don't know, uh, maybe you wanna try at some point, but this is quite common. Um, and the sharks come all around you. Um, they're not very frightened, so you can get pretty close and they circle in these big groups all day. And then at nighttime, they kind of dissipate out into the ocean. We don't see this in many other places in the world anymore. So we're very lucky in Cocos and in Galapagos to see this. But it's not just the hammerheads that live there. We're also home to the largest fish in the ocean, the whale shark. And just to give you some idea of the size, these are a couple of my team in the diving um, business uh, that are helping me out trying to identify these sharks. So this shark is probably about 10 to 12 meters long. So that's maybe 30 feet. So probably bigger than your classroom. And, uh, and they grow bigger. So these things are huge and we know very little about them. They tend to live solitary out in the ocean and every so often they come together in these aggregations. And most of these aggregations tend to be along the coast of Mozambique, Australia, Mexico, where they feed and they feed on plankton. So they're not, they're harmless. I mean, they're really gentle. They feed on plankton. Um, but in Galapagos, we never see them feeding. And also in Galapagos, we never see an aggregation. We always see one or two. So something weird is going on. And we felt that it was time to, to explore that. So those are the two species that I work with most. But we also work with tiger sharks and silky sharks and black tip sharks and, and, and what have you. The problem is, as you can see, that even though Galapagos and Cocos are protected, things sometimes don't go as planned. And these photos are all taken from inside the marine reserves. So up here on the left, this is on land in Cocos. This is Randall, he's a shark hero. He's been fighting to save sharks and turtles in Costa Rica for 20 years. He's a real warrior. And we went to shore to the park rangers hut and they've been collecting fishing gear that they found around the island. All these white things, oops, sorry, let's go back. All these are buoys connected to long lines that, that the fishermen set around the island to catch sharks and use their fins. There's thousands and thousands of them. In fact, the park rangers even made a bridge over one of the rivers made out of buoys. There's so many of them. Ah, down here is a shark being caught by a fisherman in Galapagos. Up here on the right, this is uh, a fishing boat that came into the Galapagos illegally. And look at all those shark bodies aboard. And they'd already, they've already cut all the fins off, see, out here on the right. And luckily, the park rangers and the Navy detained them and put them in jail. And then down here, these are some photos of, um, of a guy who was trying to smuggle shark fins out of Galapagos in his suitcase. Well, he had more than one suitcase. It was a couple of suitcases. And again, luckily, we have some really cool trained sniffer dogs here. You know how sometimes in the airports there are sniffer dogs and they're, they're trained to sniff out for drugs and things like that? Our dogs are trained to sniff out for shark fins. So we can protect our species from leaving the islands. So clearly we still have an issue. We have an issue of illegal fishermen coming into Galapagos and Cocos. We have an issue of some fishermen who live in Galapagos breaking the rules. But what about the third issue? What about the sharks that are in Galapagos and Cocos? What about if they leave? Then it's game, you know, game up, really. 
So we were really concerned, how much time do these animals spend inside the protected area? So we set up uh, an array of receivers underwater, all the way from Guadalupe, up, in, up off of Baja California, Rabia Jijeros, that belongs to Mexico, Clipperton in the middle of nowhere, and then in all these places around the region. And we put these receivers out, and I'll, I'll actually stop sharing my screen now and show you because I have one here. So this is a receiver. It's essentially, uh, it's got a battery and a sensor on the top, and we put it in the water, we attach it to a, a weight, so it's floating in the water and near the bottom, and it listens. And every year we go down and we pick it up and we download the data. And it's listening for data from tags that we place on sharks, turtles, even on tuna and sunfish, all sorts of things. And whenever they come close to these, it logs the time. And so by having an array of receivers, we know if animals like to stay in a particular site, if they like to move between sites, if they're there during the day, maybe at night, maybe at certain times of year, so we can get a lot of information. And in fact, if you look behind me, there's my student Steffi working very hard on some data. We've, we're actually really excited. I was a bit late for this meeting because we've been looking at some data from hammerhead sharks that we tagged years ago. And some of those tags, we thought they lasted maybe a year and they lasted five years. So we gain five years of data from one individual and we can see exactly where they go. So she's working on her thesis now, so we won't disturb her anymore. Um, <laughs> and I will go back to sharing my screen. Uh, where are we? There we go. And so down here, you can see a diver switching out the receivers so that we can, um, so we can download the data. And then, of course, we have to tag the sharks. Um, so when we tag the sharks, we, 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 we jump in. Um, mostly, we try not to use scuba tanks uh, because sharks don't really like bubbles very much. Um, and so we try to free dive. And in Galapagos, that's quite easy because the sharks are close to the surface. So we free dive down onto them. We just hold our breaths. Um, but in Cocos, where this, this photo was taken, sharks tend to be really deep uh, because there's some areas there called cleaning stations. And the reef fish like to come and pick up all the dead skin and the parasites. And the sharks are down there at the cleaning station and they're kind of dozy. It's like being in a spa, so you're just kind of chilling out. And then we can go up and, 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 and poke them with a, with a dart. Um, they don't really like that very much, but it doesn't hurt them. And they, you know, it's just like, I guess some of you maybe have your ears pierced. You know, when it happens, it hurts a little bit and then, it, and then it's over. And so we place those little tags you can see down here and they ping every minute. And then, then you can see that they're detected on the receivers. Um, sometimes though, we want to have a little bit more information. We want to put some satellite tags on sharks. And with those, what we can do is we can track the sharks as they move through the ocean. Because I guess some of you might be thinking, yeah, but Alex, how do you gather those receivers out into the middle of the ocean? It's really deep, you can't dive. How do you go and pick them up? Well, the answer is we don't. It, it's too much trouble, it's too expensive, and we can't get that deep. So for those animals that we think are gonna travel out into the ocean, we use satellite tags. And what we do there is it's got a little antenna, it's like a GPS, it's a little antenna, and we stick that on the fin of the shark. And when the shark is swimming at the surface, it sends a signal to some satellites and we can, uh, and we can find out where it is. The downside is though that, well, they're incredibly expensive. Um, and also you have to catch the shark to be able to put the tag on. And so what we do here is that we fish for them. Um, we catch them using special hooks that don't have barbs in them. Um, can you see me? Because I'm doing stuff with my hands or can you just see the screen? We can see you in the top of the screen, yeah. Right. So um, we, we hook them, but without a barb, so it's easy to release the hook afterwards. And then we put a tail rope on them and we keep them in the water so that they're still breathing, they don't suffocate. And then we'll, um, we'll do maybe a quick surgery um, to put in an acoustic tag, like the ones we had before. Uh, but then also we work on their dorsal fin. So this is one that we're working on in Cocos. This is a silky shark because they move long distances. And then this is another silky shark that's still, um, we're still trying to get it under control. Um, so, you know, th th this can be a little hectic sometimes. Uh, we need to make sure that they've got someone on the tail, someone on the head. Uh, but once you roll the shark over, the shark kind of calms down. And then once we're finished, we turn the shark back and we, and we let it go. So it can be a little stressful for the shark and for us. Um, 
but we're pretty lucky in that we have a pretty good um, survivorship record for the sharks and for us. Um, so in the, at the end of the day, uh, no one gets hurt in the long term and we get really valuable information that allows us to track their movements. Here's a hammerhead shark that we tagged recently and you can see the tag on the, on the dorsal fin attached there with some, with some box. So what have we learned? Well, um, here on the left, you can see a map of the Galapagos Islands. And, um, and we, tagged, ooh, we tagged some hammerhead sharks. In, in fact, there's a funny story. We actually rescued some divers um, who were being swept off um, San Cristobal Island, which is down here. Um, we headed out in the evening to tag some sharks. And we got a call that um, a dive boat had lost four divers. Um, and they'd been missing in the water for four hours. And that's really, some people ask me like, oh, you know, do you work with sharks and is it dangerous? Really in, in Galapagos, what's dangerous is the currents. It's not the animals. And these, these poor guys had been floating in the water for four hours and no one could find them. Um, and so we decided that night that we weren't gonna, well, it, it was still evening. Um, we weren't gonna bother fishing for sharks. We were gonna go out and try to rescue these guys. And uh, it took us a, a few hours, but the, the, the guy we worked with, the fisherman, really understands the currents. And so he thought, well, if they were diving over there and they've been, they've been floating for four hours, they're probably down here. And we were lucky enough to rescue them and find them. And they were okay. They were a little cold because they've been floating in the water for a while. Um, but um, two of them were called Luis and Johan. And so we thought we'd name, when we went out the next night to catch the sharks, we named them Luis and Johan um, to, to kind of in honor of those guys because they were saved. So Luis and Johan were two hammerheads that remained around San Cristobal. And it's kind of funny because Luis and Johan are local lads. They were two boys from San Cristobal. So they kind of like their home. But the girl, Beck, well, she's a traveler, maybe a little bolder than the boys, you know, maybe a little more adventurous. So she headed all the way up to the north of the islands, to Darwin, to Wolf, and she left the Marine Reserve and she carried on heading out. Um, this is an old map, we're still tracking her. Uh, and so we don't know where she's going to go next. Um, we'll have to see. But we're a little bit concerned because once you leave the marine reserve, you know, you could be caught in a fishing net on a fishing line. Overall, what we found is that sharks tend to hang around the islands during the day. And then at nighttime, they head out. And they don't head out as groups. They head out as individuals. And we think what they're doing there is they're hunting for their favorite prey. Any ideas what it is? Any guesses? We could ask one of the classes if you'd like. Yeah, go on. Yeah, okay, let's head to Alaska, but you're so keen on them. So, Miss Curtin's group, what do you think the shark's favorite prey is? Salmon tuna. Fish, tuna. Turtles. Two turtles, tuna, okay. Tell us, Alex. <laughs> well, um, there are sharks that eat turtles, um, but that's mostly the tigers. Hammerhead sharks have a tiny little rounded mouth underneath, and so they're not really gonna go for the turtles. Tuna are way too fast. Tuna are just streaks of light. Um, these guys mostly eat squid, and squid tend to be deep down in the water during the day. Um, they're kind of avoiding the light, but at nighttime, when all the plankton comes to the surface, the tuna come to the surface too, sorry, the tuna, the, the squid come to the surface too, and then the sharks come to catch the squid. So they're eating squid, oceanic squid mostly, okay? And, uh, and so for most of the year in, in our cool season, um, I can't really call it cold, especially not to the people in Alaska. You'll laugh at me. Um, we complain when it gets cold in Galapagos, we have to put a sweater on. <laughs> so uh, in the cool season, um, which is kind of from June through to about maybe February, March, um, the hammerhead sharks are, are in Galapagos and they're moving out every day, and every night, back during the day. And they move between these two islands of Darwin and Wolf. Of Darwin and Wolf. But then what we found is that in April, March, April, they head off and some of them ended up in Cocos Island. So for the first time, we discovered that sharks from Galapagos are also going to Cocos. And that's where our network came in. So remember Randall from the previous photo? I called him up, said, Randall, I'm getting Cocos sharks in Galapagos. And he said, Alex, I'm getting Galapagos sharks in Cocos. So we need to collaborate. We need to get this information out to our politicians to see whether we can create some kind of protection that allows them to swim between Galapagos and Cocos without getting caught on fishing lines. 
The whale sharks, on the other hand, well, that's a completely different ballgame. What we found here, this is Darwin. The whale sharks head out for thousands of miles, way out into the Pacific Ocean. And it doesn't seem like there's anything there, but actually that's an area called the equatorial front. And what you've got there is two currents sliding past each other in opposite directions. And when things slide past each other, they tend to create some friction and turbulence and plankton gets trapped in there. And you probably know the whale sharks are planktivores, right? So they eat plankton. So if I was a whale shark and I was hungry, I'd probably want to go to an oceanic front to feed. So we think they head out there to feed and then they turn around and they come all the way back. And then, oh yeah, one of them went to Cocos and then went to Malpelo as well. She did like a tour of the world heritage sites. And then the other ones tend to end up along the coast of Ecuador and Peru, which are areas where there's lots of food for them. But do you notice I said her and she, they're all females. In 10 years, we've tracked over 100 whale sharks, and I think two of them were males. What is going on? And, and not only that, but only two of them were juveniles. Do you want to know which ones they are on that map? Any guesses? We Look down. Yeah. See these sharks here in different years? Those are the two immature individuals. So the two young whale sharks, both females, they also started heading out west, but then they kind of gave up oh, it's too far and they came down. But all the adult females head out west along that front, turn around and come back again. Why no males? Why is it just those big females? Any, any ideas? Yeah, how about Miss Michael's group? What do you guys think? Why are they finding males? What do you think? Um, they're hunting. Hunting? Maybe the males are hunting. I have another theory on why. What's your theory? My theory is the reason why there's so much males um, is because I think the females started to get born more often. So the genes kept passing on of female, female, female. Yeah. Um, and because there's so many females, they can't give birth to more males. Okay. Interesting. How about That's you, Alex? What do you think? Tell us. Theory. And, and, and we were concerned that that might be the case. And as you can imagine, there would be a problem if there were no males. Right, guys? It's not all about the girls. So, you know, we, we, we mean something, too. We're important, too. Um, so we were worried about that. And so we started asking people on the coast of Ecuador and, and Peru, because they see whale sharks there, do you see males? Do you see females? And they were saying it was about 50-50. So we know there are male whale sharks. They're just not coming out there. So why only the females? Hmm. Well, that was Mr. Case class. Why only females? Why would only girls go one place? Do you have any thoughts? Um, my theory is um, the males, the males are um, looking for the females to be their mates, but the males don't know where the females are. The males just have no idea how to track them down. They're all out there. They're getting lost. <laughs> Alex, how do you tell us? Could well be the case. The males just don't know how to find them. That, again, that would be a problem in the long term for the species, right? If they can't, if they can't mate. We wondered whether they were pregnant um, because it was just those big adult females. And we wondered whether whale sharks were pupping out there somewhere. Because I don't know if you know, but whale sharks don't lay eggs. They have live young. And they can have up to 300 babies inside them. Uh, and no one knows where they go to give birth. It's, it's one of the biggest mysteries in the ocean. No one knows. Uh, all over the world, I think they found about 20 baby whale sharks that are less than a meter, you know, maybe three feet long. Uh, and they seem to be out in the deep sea. So, so we thought they might be pregnant. And maybe, maybe this is a pupping ground, you know, this big area here. But how would you figure out whether a female whale shark was pregnant? Because you can't really ask them, can you? <laughs> we, I guess this is a difficult question. So we used to laugh about this. So we used to say, well, how about if we could do an ultrasound? You know, when people think they might be pregnant, and we go to the doctor and they do an ultrasound. And we're like, yeah, that would be really cool to do. But how, how are you going to do an ultrasound on a whale shark? swimming at 60 feet deep and in three knots of current out in the open ocean. Um, that's a little crazy. Well, um, sometimes crazy talk can 
come come true. And uh, and we did it. Um, we we were able to partner with the Okinawa Aquarium. They have a team of amazing divers. They have whale sharks in their aquarium, and they have an underwater ultra ultrasound. And so we went out there with the team, went out to Galapagos, and uh, and I told them, you know, every whale shark that you see is going to be a female, so just go for it. And then the first whale shark we saw was a male. And the guy says to me, what do I do? I said, just ultrasound it anyway. It doesn't matter. It's the first ultrasound of a wild whale shark. So we got a great ultrasound of a male whale shark. And as you can imagine, it wasn't great. Um, and then we started ultrasounding females. And guess what? Not pregnant. Not pregnant. So we still don't know why it's only males out there. We will continue to take where, um, ultrasounds. We'll take some blood samples. Maybe males and females eat different kinds of food, but that's still a mystery. Um, and if we haven't solved it by the time you guys get to university, maybe one of you can come over and give me a hand because we're struggling with this one. But what we have discovered is that the ocean is a complete network. Animals aren't just bumbling around in the ocean trying to figure things out. They know where to go. Um, and they do it back and forth. They have clear pathways in which to travel. And one of the main things we noticed here is that there seems to be a lot of connections between Cocos and Galapagos. And it's not just hammerhead sharks and it's not just whale sharks. It's green turtles too. It's leatherback turtles. It's, um, it's Galapagos sharks, it's silky sharks. A lot of species seem to enjoy moving between Galapagos and Cocos. So we really started thinking about, well, you know, maybe it's time that we thought about protecting these areas properly. And so what we've done is we did some really cool expeditions. We worked with a really famous guy called Boris Worm, um, uh, who's actually the, 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 the guy who designed Ocean School, which we'll talk about in a little while. And they went down in subs, you can see down here, to check out what's out there. We've tracked some hammerhead sharks out to sea mounts. And what we understood was that there's actually a chain of underwater mountains that links Cocos and Galapagos. And it seems like the sharks and the turtles are moving along this chain of mountains, almost like stepping stones in the ocean. And so we're talking now with the governments of both countries to create something called a swimway. And a swimway is a little bit like a flyway or a highway on land. It's an area where migrating animals can be protected. And the important thing about migration, oh, hang on, there's a chat here. How do I? Yeah, okay. So the important thing here is to protect those animals as they migrate. Um, and there you can see them migrating between the two islands. So that's our main work. And just to wrap up here, we also work with the babies, right? Because that's a lot about the adults. Um, and we're doing surveys now with drones to understand how baby sharks move. Um, here's a quick video of, of, of some there. I don't know if you can see that. So you can see down there, there's some adults and some babies together. Those are different species, um, white tips and black tips, swimming around. And then, oops. That's a baby hammerhead. That was our first ever baby hammerhead shark that we caught. And that was so important that we ended up publishing a book about her, Marty the Hammerhead, um, that we're trying to distribute amongst uh, coastal communities so that they understand that when, that when their parents catch hammerheads by accident, that we have to release them into the ocean. Um, and, oh, there you go. So there's my daughters, that's Isa and Sophie, checking out Marty the Hammerhead. And that's one of my heroes, Sylvia Earle, who's basically one of the most important ocean explorers of all time. And finally, one of the things we really like to do is to develop materials so that you guys and other schools can understand the importance of the ocean. So it's really important for us to work with educators to understand. And uh, Ocean School, uh, which is what we've been working with over the last few months, is, is basically a free tool that anyone can use from all over the world. And we're gonna be launching our Cocos expedition, I think it's next week, I think it's pretty soon. I'm really excited about it. I wanna see uh, how, it, how it pans out. And I hope you are too. And I'd love to hear from you if you explore our Cocos material and, and tell us how, you, how it went. 
Alex, that was such a cool presentation. Uh, and again, Ocean School for Class is free. I'm going to pass it along, link to all this when we're done. So you guys can check that out. It's the coolest ocean resource I ever personally checked out myself, not the Cocoa session. So I'm excited for those. Um, but yeah, that was an amazing presentation. In addition to our live classes, we've got a bunch watching on YouTube from North Carolina, Minnesota, Ontario, and more. Um, and so Alex, if we can dive in with questions, uh, literally and figuratively, that would be fantastic. All right, go ahead. All right, let me head to Ms. Michaels' class first, and then we'll go to Ms. Jordan's. I know you guys have to leave in the next few minutes, so Ms. Michaels' group, come on up first. Okay, we have two questions that kind of go together. So Perfect. <laughs> let's see. So you can, you guys come up and ask your questions. Join together. Kind of match each other. Okay, I'll go first. Um, what is the average size of a whale shark, and what is the average size of a baby whale shark? Okay. Um, Go ahead and follow up with your question before he answers. What is the biggest whale shark you've ever seen? Cool. So on average, we think that when they are born, they're about um, just under three feet long. Do you guys think in feet or in meters? They would be a, they'd be a feet class. We got all Americans, so it's all feet today. <laughs> uh, yeah, so maybe two and a half feet, something like that. Okay, when they're when they're born, maybe a little smaller. We don't really know because, to be honest with you, the only real experience we have with newborn whale sharks was a big mama mama whale shark. She was caught in Taiwan in 1995. Unfortunately, she was she was dead. You know, when when they brought her up and they cut her open, she had she had the embryos inside her, and some of them were so close to being born that they were able to keep them in tanks and, and actually continue through the birth. And they were about two and a half feet. The biggest the whale shark can get, I think officially it's, let's see, 18 meters, so that's what, about 40, 50 feet, something like that, 50 yeah. feet. You don't really see them that large anymore, um, but the biggest I've seen is about 45 feet, which is humongous, by the way. It's so big, you feel like there should be some noise associated with it, some rumbling, but of course everything's silent in the ocean, so uh, yeah, it's crazy big. Um, and that, yeah, that's the biggest one I've seen. That was fantastic. Thanks, uh, Alex. All right, let's head to Miss George's group. Uh, come on up, guys. Uh, yeah. Can you see us? Yeah, you're good to go. Ask the question. How do y'all pick the trackers on them? Oh, yeah. And how many sharks are in the water? So how many total sharks are there, and how do you put the trackers on them, Alex? Well, on, obviously we can't catch a whale shark um, uh, like we did with the silky shark. So when we put trackers on whale sharks, what we do is we have um, we have a tag like this, um, and we attach it to a little clamp like a, a, a pincer thing. And so we swim down, and we just attach it onto the fin, and it sits there quite nicely. It has a couple of pads, so it sits in kind of comfortably, and then it just swims around. And eventually, because it's made of metal, it rusts and it, and it falls off. So that's, that's what we do with the whale sharks. Obviously with the other sharks, we're able to catch them, bring them alongside of the boat. But the whale shark, that would, it wouldn't be fair to do that with the whale shark. Um, what was the other question? The other question was, how many sharks are there in the ocean? Not as many as there used to be, uh, unfortunately. So we don't have an actual number, but we know that between 70 and 100 million sharks are caught each year. And that is more than they can recover. Um, some sharks have been fished so heavily, the oceanic white tip, which is a shark I would love to see, I've never seen it before, um, but in some areas it's down to less than 1%. So when there used to be 100, there'd be only one left, and that's a real problem. So some areas still have healthy shark populations, a lot of areas don't, um, but we don't have a final number. Yeah. A lot of people, when they think of conservation, think of cute, cuddly animals, they think of mammals, whether it's bears, lions, pandas, etc. And sharks are such a huge part of oceanic ecosystems, as you know. Uh, yeah, and there's cute, adorable books. I'm sorry, I said most people feel that way, but we all know that sharks are adorable, of course. <laughs> the baby hammerhead was beautiful. Um, awesome, guys. Uh, let's head to Mr. Corsi's class. You guys want to come up? Go for it. Oh my goodness, love. Um, where else do um, whale sharks live? Okay, um, whale sharks are found all over the world in tropical and subtropical waters. So from about 30 degrees north to 30 degrees south. Um, once you get into colder waters, such as Northern Europe, Canadian waters, 
um, or really South America, it's just too cold for them. Um, they tend to be out in the open ocean on their own, but there's some sites, there's about a dozen sites that every season, uh, mostly males actually in this case, appear along the coast to feed. They're like feeding grounds. So they feed on coral spawn or fish spawn. And some of those sites are Western Australia, um, La Paz in, in Baja California, um, where else? Gulf of Mexico, um, Mozambique. So there's some areas, but mostly they're just on their own out in the open ocean. Super cool. All right. Uh, Miss Curtin's group, come on up. And a quick note for you, Alex. Miss Curtin's group always likes to take a picture with the speakers at the end. So once we're done the live session, we'll make sure we can arrange that, uh, if that's okay. Uh, but yeah, for now, come on up with a question, guys. Me, me. Uh, I'll, uh, somebody go. I'll do your question. Thank you. Fight for it. <laughs> 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 Don't actually fight for it. Yeah, I was there first. Shut it down. Yay. How can you tell if it's a male or female? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How the question. Um, so sharks can be sexed quite easily. So sharks have lots of different fins. It's a shame I haven't got a blow up shark. I have a blow up shark somewhere. It's probably in my car. Um, but they have their pectoral fins, but also they have something called an aim, uh, their, their pelvic fins, which is just by where they poop, right? And the females just have the two fins like that. So if you turn them over, it's just got the two fins, but the males, the end of the fin is modified into something called a clasper. So it's got these two claspers, and it's quite obvious to see. If you like, uh, now you'll, I think you'll have, I don't have one ready to show you, but, um, but they're called claspers, and there's two of them. And so if you turn it over, you can definitely see if it's got claspers, it's a male. If it hasn't got claspers, it's a female. Yeah, for any of the classes, you can look this up really, really easily. And if you ever get a chance to go to an aquarium, it's really noticeable the claspers. You cannot mistake a male shark for a female shark. So good question, guys. And that was the closest we've ever got to actual fist fights for a question. Way to go. Um, whale sharks are just that cool. Let's go to Miss Vitato's class. Come on up, guys. <laughs> so do the sharks make do the sharks move differently if there's a major weather disturbance like a hurricane? Do you know what that is that is a really interesting question and, and i don't know the answer to it but um when we were tagging hammerheads a few years ago um we had two tsunamis um in the in the in the island where where i was working um there was an earthquake in chile and then there was the japan earthquake too and one of the things i've always wanted to do and I, to be honest i haven't got around to doing it is try and figure out the timing of when the tsunami hit the island of Darwin and just look at whether those detections on these receivers of the sharks change in any way. I think they might not because um, once something like a tsunami underwater comes past very quickly and in, out in the open ocean in deep water doesn't have much effect. I think it might change their behavior if they're in, in, in closer to coastal waters. Um, obviously one thing that can be a problem is if there's a hurricane and there's a lot of debris and trash that gets swept into the ocean, then that can have an effect, especially with sharks that tend to be more coastal that will eat anything like tiger sharks and bull sharks. They might be ingesting things like suitcases and car tires and things which they shouldn't really be eating. Um, but I think for the most part, no, they should be able to kind of just avoid any, any, any issues. Yeah, neat question though, thanks so much. Um, yeah. All right, let's do a few more. Ms. Rukowski's class, come on up guys. You. Okay. Oh, um, you start, Lucas. Look at the camera. How much? Look at the how much food do whale sharks? Can whale sharks put in their mouth? And um, why do people want to eat whale sharks' fins? Yeah. Okay. All right. That's two two great questions. Um. So whale shark whale sharks have couple of ways of feeding. Um, they can just open their mouths and swim forward, but they can also turn vertically into the water and suck down. And they can eat tons of, uh, of food in one big mouthful. So they're pretty good. And remember they're filter feeders, right? So it's a tiny little plankton. So they can, I mean, they need a lot of food, right? They're big animals. Um, as to the second part of the question, um, so there is something called whale shark tofu. Um, so whale shark meat is not very nice. It's kind of spongy and watery, but they do sometimes eat whale shark tofu. 
Um, the fins used to be, because they're quite large, um, they used to be um, used as uh, ornaments. Um, but now what they do is they dissolve the, the, the skin and with the little bits of, of, of material in the fins, they use them for shark fin soup, which kind of sucks a little bit. Actually, I have a couple of photos. I want to see if I can share the screen with you again, because I have photos of that. Um, where is it here? Okay. Um, so that, can you see? Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So those are the claspers of the males, and that's a female that doesn't have the claspers. And then, um, where is it? Ah, so there's the shark fin. So this is a factory in, in, in China where they're processing 600 sharks each year for their fins, um, which kind of sucks with their meat. And then if you can see, that's a shark that's been sliced open. So they, um, the, 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 there's, there's kind of skin and meat, but there's not a lot in there that's particularly pleasant. So instead of seeing those photos, we'd rather people focus on this kind of thing and on the live resource, which is really one of the most beautiful animals in the world. That they are. Glad we got the question, but yes, it's a difficult topic. And uh, I'm, again, we're really thankful to be able to talk about it today. Um, all right, uh, two questions left. Uh, Mr. K's class, if you guys want to come up first, and uh, then we'll go to Ms. DeMaios in a second. I heard they can get real old. Why is that? Why do they live so long? Yeah. Well, that, that, again, that's a really interesting question. So I guess life on Earth has many different strategies, right? Um, and on the one hand, you could, as a species, you could be a kind of animal that doesn't live very long, but you grow really fast, you have lots and lots of babies, and so the species carries on. And that's one way of, of doing things. So for example, maybe a tuna might live for maybe four or five years, um, probably laying eggs after two years, and lays millions of eggs, and then most of those don't even hatch. Um, but, and that's how you use your energy, you use your energy in, in kind of growing fast and making lots of eggs. The other strategy is to maybe have a longer life and you grow more slowly and maybe you have less offspring. So a hammerhead maybe only has 35 or 15. Humans, maybe we only have one or two or three if it's triplets. Um, and so it really depends on, on the strategy of life. And the problem is that species that have that slow strategy such as sharks, gorillas, tigers, they tend to not do so well when we start hunting them. And that's why they end up in danger of extinction. So it's their strategy. It's worked really well. Those guys have been around for 500 million years, but it didn't prepare them for us, to be frank. And, and we're killing them so fast that they just can't handle that kind of mortality. A quick follow up on that, just to ask, do we know how long whale sharks live? We don't, but we suspect somewhere between, you know, 65 and 100 years old. So pretty much like us. Wow, very cool. I can't it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I will wrap up with Mr. Mayo's group. If you want to come up and ask one last question, go for it. What, what are whale sharks natural predator? Huh. I think once they get to the size of the ones that we see, not a lot. Um, but we have seen whale sharks with considerable bites in their size. Um, and we think those could be from orcas. Um, we, there are reports of white sharks attacking, uh, attacking whale sharks and you know maybe even tiger sharks, but probably when they're a lot smaller and then they just have the scars and the scars stretch as they grow. Um, but I think there's probably not a lot that's going to attack an animal that big. And there's not that nutritious either. As you said, spongy and watery doesn't sound very appetizing. Uh, Alex, before we wrap up, you've already mentioned Ocean School, and we're going to highlight that and again share it with all our classes. Where can we guide kids to learn more about the work that you're doing uh, when they're done this session to keep the excitement going? Well, um, I have a Facebook site that I'm always posting our material on. Um, so you can just check me out on Alex Hearn. Um, we have a Migramar website and Facebook site as well. That's for our regional network. That's migramar.org or just Migramar on Facebook. So those are the two kind of Facebook and, and websites are the areas where we, we focus most. And all, you're, I'm always happy to answer questions if you want to contact me by email as well. So if you ask people with emails, um, my email, then that's cool too. Perfect. Thank you, Alex.
Fantastic. Well, we will do that and we prepare for you to be absolutely inundated with I think every class had about 20 questions for you. Um, so with that, uh, how we end every session, Alex, is I'm going to demute the microphones of every single class. So if you guys get ready, boys and girls, to say a huge thank you to Alex for joining us today. You are all now demuted. Go for it. <laughs> Do you think they had a good time and learned a lot about whale sharks? I think that was that might be the most enthusiastic screaming there's ever been in the history of exploring by the seat of your pants. Um, so we're going to end the live broadcast.